Hello. Uh, in the absence of Dean Sony, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today. I'm director of the USC Levin Institute for Humanities and Ethics, and we co-sponsor the Spirit of the Law series with the Office for Religious Life. The Spirit of the Law features legal professionals discussing how they find meaning and purpose in the law, how they use their law degrees in innovative and creative ways, and how they connect the personal and the professional in their lives. Today we welcome Niels Frenzen. Professor Frenzen specializes in immigration law and is director of the USC Law Immigration Clinic. He's been teaching at USC since 2000 and practicing law since 1985. Prior to joining USC, he practiced with nonprofit law offices in Los Angeles and Miami. His work experience includes serving as direct, uh, excuse me, directing attorney of the Immigrants' Rights Project, public counsel in Los Angeles, as supervising attorney of the Haitian Refugee Center, and as legislative coordinator of the Iowa Civil Liberties Union. Professor Frenzen has represented hundreds of asylum seekers and other immigrants, and has lit lit excuse me, litigated numerous lawsuits challenging their mistreatment. He has participated in human rights delegations on behalf of Amnesty International USA, the International Association of Democratic Lawyers, and other human rights organizations in Haiti, Cuba, El Salvador, Mexico, and the U.S. Naval Base in Guantanamo, Cuba. Please welcome Professor Fenton. Doing these things always, you know, reminds me I'm, I'm not as young as I as I think I am. So uh, even even though my wife always assures me that uh, I still have, you know, a certain immaturity streak. <laughs> I'm sure some of my students who are here for the free lunch could, you know, can, can, can can attest to that. Um, but anyway, so you know, so thanks thanks for the invita the invitation. And and I thought I, you know, what I, what I would do was talk a little bit, you know, not so much how I got to, you know, where I am today at, you know, at USC. Something I, I, you know, frankly would would never have imagined in my wildest dreams for, you know, a whole variety of issues. Uh, I'll try not to move around too much. Sorry, um, uh, it's tough not to pace. But I thought what I would, you know, do is, you know, sort of talk about, you know, some of the things I went through in in law school. Um, and how I got into this, into this, you know, sort of field, and, and you know, it's a field that uh, a lot of people refer to as, as public interest law. Um, it's not, you know, it's not a term that, that I ever used as a as a law student or a young lawyer. I think it might not have been a term that was really, you know, used that much, at, at, you know, at the time. And, and you know, I have some I have some issues with it, and I'm happy to, you know, ha happy to talk about it. But I, you know, I'm one of those people, like some of you here, hopefully not most of you here, uh, went to law school at a time when I, I was a French major in college, and I went to law school at a time when I really didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, uh, and I've always been very sure about things I did not want to do. Um, I knew I didn't want to do this, I, didn't, I knew I didn't want to do that. Um, uh, and uh, so I was very good at, you know, sort of ruling out things as opposed to sort of deciding where I went to, you know, where I wanted to go. My dad's a lawyer, a uh, retired lawyer now, retired judge, uh, and he advised me very strongly against going to law school and, and had very strong views of, of lawyers um, and, and encouraged me to become an engineer or, do, you know, be something, you know, do something productive. And, and I, I ignored, that, <laughs> ignored that advice. Um, so, you know, so I ended up in, you know, in law school. I started law school. Uh, I went to Drake University in, in Iowa. I'd gone to college from the East Coast. I'd gone to college in, in Wisconsin and uh, uh, ended up at, at Drake University for a variety of reasons, grades being being one of them. Uh, um, uh, I didn't have you know as many choices of law schools as I uh, couldn't have gotten into USC. That's for you know, that's for darn sure. Maybe, maybe I could have in 1982. I, uh, I'd have to go back and look and see how selective we were. But the West Coast just wasn't on my you know wasn't on my uh, you know radar screen at the time. And, and you know, I start law school. Uh, this is the beginning of the Reagan administration. Uh, it seemed like really difficult times back then, but the reality is, is in terms of you know uh, the, the, some of the politics we've lived through since 2000, 2001, the Reagan administration uh, years seem like positively you know progressive times. And, and I never thought I would say that, but you know I long for the immigration amnesty and whatnot of uh, of, of, of the Reagan years. Um, but, but the Reagan administration did implement some really harsh immigration policies. Um, I had taken a year off from college. I was studying in France. Um, and the beginning of the Reagan administration uh, you know, over, resulted in some significant changes in, in human rights practices in the Western Hemisphere uh, and, and the rest of the world. Because the United States 
uh, under President Jimmy Carter had made human rights very much a, a central focus of, 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 our, of our foreign policy. And Reagan, when he came into office, basically said he was going to change that. And one of the things that changed was U.S. policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, dictatorship, uh, a brutal dictatorship in Haiti, uh, the Duvalier dictatorship. And so I'm in France. Haiti's a former colony. It was getting a, a, lot of, a lot of coverage in France. I'm in France, and I'm seeing these images uh, of the Reagan administration locking up uh, tens of thousands of Haitian boat people who are starting to flee to the United States in, in, in large numbers. Um, and this was a direct uh, result of a change of, of, of the of, you know, reduction in pressure uh, on the part of the Duvalier dictatorship to, uh, uh, to conform with human rights obligations. And so there were you know, people being killed in the streets, and, and you know, my, my, some of my clinic students you know, encouraged me to tell you know, tragic and sad and horrible stories. Um, um, and you know, I, 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 you know, I, I, you know, I'm joking about it, even though you know I'm, I'm not joking about it in some sense. But you know, the human rights violations that were perpetrated in, uh, under the Duvalier dictatorship in Haiti were brutal and, and ugly. And and one of the things about torture and human rights violations, it's a it's an effort to cow the general population to intimidate. Uh, and so one of the specialties of the Duvalier dictatorship in the 80s was killing people, torturing people, and then putting them in chairs. Uh, out in the middle of the street in their neighborhood, the, the dead body or the tortured body or, or, or the person who might still be alive. And that was very effective um, uh, in terms of intimidating the rest of the people in the neighborhood. Um, uh, the family members and, and people would be very hesitant to go out and recover the body and, 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 and bury the body because they didn't want to be associated. Uh, they didn't want the, the informants and the police and the military to see that, um, you know, that they were, you know, were going out to, to bury their, their grandfather, their neighbor, or their son, or, or what may be the case. Um, so, you know, this violence exploded in Haiti, um, coinciding with the early days of the, of the Duvalier dictatorship, uh, the early days of the, the, the Reagan administration, a little slip there, uh, uh, the Reagan administration, and th tens of thousands of Haitians started to come to the United States. And, and what uh, the Reagan administration did in a nutshell is said, we need to stop this. We're going to start detaining people. And the U.S. began in 1981. Uh, to detain and said we did not have detention facilities, immigration detention facilities like we do today. Um, the U.S. set up a series of detention camps uh, in, the, in the United States to detain patients. Um, and that's who was behind bars while their immigration proceedings uh, you know, were, were, were basically going forward. Um, so I come to the United States not knowing you know, what, I, what I wanted to do coming from France, coming you know, for, from a year in France. Uh, and, and the Haitians were very much on my, on my radar screen, and it was just something that caught my attention. I naively thought my French would help me with Haitians. Uh, French is, uh, uh, is, is, is the language of the, uh, of the oppressor in Haiti. The elite speak it. Um, uh, the, the, the average Haitian does not speak French. They speak uh, Creole, Haitian Creole. Some similarities, but one can't converse. Uh, if one speaks Creole and one speaks uh, French, you can, you can probably count together and things like that, but you, you, know, you, can't, you can't really communicate. Uh, but I you know, ended up getting my $500 stipend uh, from the National Lawyers Guild and, and went down and, and worked uh, uh, in, in Miami, and uh, it, was a, it was an eye-opening experience for me. Um, I come from, uh, uh, you know, from, a, from a family that is not religious uh, for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, I started working for a Haitian priest uh, who, had, who had been exiled by the Duvalier regime. Uh, he was a liberation theologist, something I was not, uh, uh, not well informed of. Um, uh, he was a, you know, a crazy, radical priest uh, um, uh, who, had, you know, who had been disciplined by the Archbishop in, in, in Florida, had been disciplined by the Vatican. Uh, he had slowly had all of his priestly authority was was uh, uh, you know was being was being stripped uh, from him because of his political uh, his political actions. Um, uh, and this guy, you know, who was not a lawyer, uh, who, who died a, a few years ago, um, uh, he, he had been in and out of prison for many years in, in, in Haiti, even though he was only, you know, 10 years older than, uh, the, than I was. His, you know, his years in, in Haitian, you know, in, in Haitian prisons is, is, is not something that's conducive to a, uh, 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 to a long life, but he finally died of, of leukemia a few years ago. But this was just, you know, someone, you know, an individual who I just couldn't, you know, understand and you know, couldn't, couldn't imagine. Uh, and we represented Haitian boat people with, with asylum cases, and so this is the work you know I do with my with my clinic students here at, at USC uh, today. Um, 
we would be, we had two, three lawyers at any given moment at this organization called the Haitian Refugee Center. Um, we're representing uh, um, uh, thousands and thousands of, of Haitians. Um, I would be in court uh, generally four days a week. Um, uh, we do your client meetings in the evenings and on the weekends, and you were generally in court, you know, a solid day, four days a week doing, uh, doing asylum hearings. Uh, and the one thing I did, you know, for the first, you know, four or five years of my career is I lost every damn case I, uh, um, uh, I litigated. Uh, we would, you know, our office would probably do about a thousand asylum cases a year. Um, and we would be lucky if we would win one. Um, I won in my years, you know, my three or four years down in Miami, I won two cases. Um, and I can still remember the clients and the facts of their cases uh, very clearly. A uh, significant majority of our clients were in these immigration detention centers at any given moment. Uh, I remember one client committing suicide after um, we had lost his case and lost his appeal because uh, he could not bear the thought of being deported to Haiti and, and facing torture. And you know, to him, uh, uh, taking his own life by hanging himself uh, at the Chrome Detention Center uh, in, in at the edge of the uh, you know the eastern edge of the Everglades was a better and safer and more prudent outcome uh, than than being deported to Haiti and facing. Um, uh, you know, facing his, uh, you know, facing what he felt was, you know, certain death um, at the hands of, uh, at, you know, at the hands of torturers. We were also, and this, you know, this was something I was involved with as a law student, and, and, and then ultimately as a, as a young attorney, we were also involved in an equal protection challenge uh, to uh, the Reagan administration's check detention, patient-only detention policy. And I, you know, I've got a few people in here from my immigration law class. Um, I, I talk about this case in the, you know, in the, in the first few days of immigration law. Usually, um, uh, you know, what, what, you know, the, the, your equal protection alarm bell should be, you know, should be going off. Um, some of you who, who've taken my immigration law case are, are familiar with the Chinese exclusion case, the Che Chan Ping case, uh, where the Supreme Court held in the 1880s uh, that the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, and its various protections are irrelevant. Uh, do not apply to non-citizens who are seeking to come, uh, seeking to come to the United States. Um, and we thought, um, uh, um, you know, we thought, and, and you know, the, 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 the attorneys I was working with for as a law student, and uh, you know, in the early days when this case was brought, we thought this was an opportune moment for the U.S. Supreme Court in the 1980s uh, to revisit the holding of, of Che Chan Ping, the Chinese exclusion case. Uh, you know, from the 1890s, how could the court say that it is constitutional uh, to detain one nationality to the exclusion of all other nationalities? So, you know, we won that case uh, in, in 1985. Uh, Jean V. Nelson, Jean V. Nelson, uh, Jean Marie Jean was the was the lead plaintiff in the case. Uh, uh, Alan Nelson was the the old the former Immigration and Naturalization Service Commissioner. We won it on a technicality. Uh, we won it on the basis of, for those of you who are in administrative law, on an APA Act violation uh, that the regulatory authority that the Reagan administration had promulgated, had used to promulgate the Haitian-only detention policy was, was, was done so in violation of the APA. The court just did not want to deal with the constitutional law issue. Chen Chen Chinese exclusion is still good law. Um, uh, but, you know, we won the case. Uh, uh, clients, you know, thousands of people, uh, um, uh, uh, the class of detained Haitians were released from these detention centers in Puerto Rico, in Texas, Louisiana, Florida. Um, uh, um, uh, you know, what, what happened? Uh, we have a detention policy today. Um, uh, and the detention policy that we have today, we have a massive detention uh, policy for, for immigrants who are undergoing removal proceedings in the United States. The Reagan administration repromulgated its regulation and said, okay, we're not just gonna detain Haitians, we're gonna detain everyone who's under removal proceedings. And, and you know, it, it's just a nice little lesson, a horrible little lesson, uh, in terms of the unintended, unintended consequences of, of litigation. You win, but you lose big. Um, uh, you know what could what could one have done? Could you know could 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 the Haitian Refugee Center really not have challenged this? Obviously, you know we're challenging it in the streets. We're challenging it in Congress. We're challenging it you know through 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 political activism, um, uh, and we were challenging it through you know through legal theories. And so again, it's a you know it's a clear it was a clear cut victory uh, before the Supreme Court. Thousands of people get released. 
Um, uh, you know, we, we benefited from the, fee, the federal fee shifting statute, the Equal Access to Justice Act, the EJA. Um, you know, we were awarded several million dollars in, 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 in attorney's fees and costs for litigating this case uh, before the district court and the 11th Circuit and up to the, up to the, uh, to the Supreme Court. So we were the prevailing party, definitely, but there were, you know, there were these, you know, horrible, you know, horrible, you know, horrible consequences. Would this have happened, you know, would this have happened anyway, you know, even without the case, you know, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> what else can I say? But it really, you know, I mean, you know maybe just you know a few, uh, you know, a few things. I, I left Miami, came out here in, in 1987 to work with Central American uh, refugees. Uh, you know, going back to my, you know, sort of initial point, I, you know, I've always known what I didn't want to do. I knew I didn't want to work in a law firm. I knew I didn't want to represent corporations. Uh, nothing wrong, I suppose, with representing British Petroleum or, or whatever. It's just you know, it's just it's just not my cup of tea, um, uh, and and it might be your cup of tea, and that's you know that's fine, uh, you know BP and and, and and all the I you know I, I use gasoline, so you know I, 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 I you know I need companies to be you know drilling and, uh, uh, and and producing gas. I you know I wish it could be done in a you know more environmentally and uh, sensitive and, and, and with more respect to, you know to uh, uh, you know to the human rights of people who are affected by you know by, by oil production. But you know, anyway. Um, uh, and I, I've always just sort of felt and what's motivated me and, and I, I've never turned back since, uh, you know, I started working at the Haitian Refugee Center in the, in the summer of 1983. I never turned back from representing immigrants um, seeking asylum or, or other forms of, of, of protection in the United States. It's been something that's, you know, been incredibly rewarding to me. Um, uh, you know, very frustrating. We, you know, we, 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 we were in court, uh, you know, this morning, uh, um, this morning, and uh, you know, we won a we won a case uh, uh, for a you know for a transgender um, uh, woman from you know male to female transgender woman uh, from from uh, Mexico who's been you know brutally attacked by police and beaten and burned with cigarettes and uh, things like that. You know, the, the various things that 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 happens to transgender individuals in South and Central America and Mexico, as well as you know other 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 places around the world. It's difficult in the United States uh, as, as as someone who is transgender, but it's even more difficult in small towns in, in Mexico. And you know, so she's been in custody for a year. Um, uh, she's a uh, you know, as, as as ICE would say, immigration and customs enforcement would say, you know, she's an illegal alien. Um, she's a non-citizen who's present in the United States without papers. Um, uh, facing removal to the, uh, uh, you know, facing removal back to back to Mexico to a very, you know, uh, dangerous uh, future, and you know she's probably being processed as we speak, and, and hopefully will be, you know, cut loose by nine o'clock at night. ICE has a immigration and customs enforcement has a nasty habit of releasing people from custody at 10, 11, you know, 12 o'clock at night. Um, and they walk out into the streets, uh, you know, from their detention facilities, and uh, and, uh, and and you know that that creates problems for you know for some individuals. Our, our client should have someone, uh, not us, but should have a friend there, you know, who's going to be able to meet her. But it's things like that that you know that that really you know even 25 plus years later, you know, it's things like that that that, that you know are, are, are very satisfying to me. Um, you know, we haven't solved you know just to pick on this uh, uh, particular client, Maria. Uh, we have haven't solved Maria, all of Maria's problems by, by any means. Um, uh, you know, Maria's got a very difficult uh, uh, life ahead of her, um, uh, but you know, we've just given her legal identity, we're going to be able to give her a work permit, we're going to be able to remove the fear of uh, removal and harm, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, to, you know, fear of removal and, and, and harm and torture in Mexico from her. And you know, a lot of our clients, you know, are able to, you know, are able to take this thing, this small thing that we help them with, and and uh, and, and and lead a, you know, lead a, you know, lead a, you know, a, a good productive life. Um, even though again, she's gonna, you know, she's she's someone who's, you know, doesn't have much education and has a criminal history. Fortunately, doesn't have a, you know, some of our clients do doesn't have a drug problem and, and things like that. But uh, anyway, like life is difficult. So why don't I why don't I stop there? Um, I, I, uh, I've babbled enough. Um, uh, just you know, in, you know, you know, we've got some chips left, but uh, if, if there are any uh, no sandwiches. But if we've got some, uh, if you have any questions, uh, you know, I'll just say when I came out here, I worked at Public Council, uh, which is a large nonprofit law office here in town for for 14 years, um, and then I started teaching here at USC as a, as an adjunct. 
um, and uh, and then you know joined the faculty as a clinical professor in 2000. Um, you know, to go back to my law school days, I hated law school. Um, uh, and you know, a lot of my students love law school, and that's good. Your your life is a lot easier if you, if you love law school. I really didn't like law school, and, and I saw law school as a as a as a as a path to getting my bar license um, and being able to practice. And, and I saw it as a tool for uh, you know for for doing things that I thought you know might 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 help people. Um, and so I you know I stuck it out and. Uh, uh, I've never applied for a job with a with a law firm in my life. Nothing wrong with that. Um, uh, but I am, you know, I definitely am, you know, uh, uh, in the minority in that regard. And so, for any of you who are out there thinking of, you know, alternate, you know, non-mainstream careers, you know, we certainly don't have time to talk about it uh, now. But uh, or, or we've got a few minutes. But you know, feel free to shoot me an email or. Um, I'm happy to you know chat with people as I've done with some of you already in the past, and you know I'll, I'll encourage you to you know explore other opportunities. So why don't I why don't I stop there? Yeah, that'd be great. So are there any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Uh, question. So I know you talked about in uh, our immigration class about the new law that's coming down the pipeline, possibly. Do you think that's generally going to create more of a need for legal service or less of a need for legal services if the law is passed? I mean, the, 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 the reality, I mean, you know, we're talking about comprehensive immigration reform and, and there's so much, you know, just happening again in the, in the past couple of days, new political fighting between the White House and, 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 and some in the Senate over leaked, uh, leaked proposals and whatnot. But, you know, the reality is, and, and of, the, of the 11, 12 million undocumented people here in the United States, you know, they, they, they and this might not be, you know, Precisely your question, but but a lot of them are just not eligible for any direct path to, to legalization under the current law. Even though we've talked about some of them have relatives who can petition to immigrate them, but they would have to leave the country to do that, and that, that that's problematic. And so it's not like this 11, 12 million people are are accessing uh, legal services. Um, uh, you know, the one thing I will say is, and this was something that Ronald Reagan started um, with his uh, changing of the legal service uh, funding rules, and Bill Clinton put the fi you know, finishing touches on this in, in 1996 when, when Bill Clinton was out Republicing uh, the Republicans. Um, uh, but the legal aid groups, uh, the legal services corporation funded organizations, and this is the mechanism by which we fund civil legal aid in the United States, have been banned since 1996 from providing legal services to most people who lack immigration status. And car Congress has carved out some exceptions uh, to domestic violence survivors, torture survivors, trafficked individuals who've been subjected to, you know, to human trafficking. So there are, you know, some of these, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, groups of the undocumented population in the United States who are able to access legal aid, uh, you know, legal services, uh, corporation-funded uh, uh, services. And in LA, you know, it's Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles in the basin, and neighborhood legal services up in, in San Fernando and San Gabriel and uh, valleys and, and, and northern LA, you know, the high desert, northern LA County. Um, so, you know, this population, if and when uh, comprehensive immigration reform leads to some uh, 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 permanent legal status, they will become eligible for, for LSC funded uh, you know, uh, services in LAPA right now, Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles is laying people off and, or you know, uh, you know, facilitating early retirement um, uh, due to their you know, cut, bu budget cutbacks. So there's definitely gonna be a more you know, greater demand as you legalize, uh, legalize more people and I'm not sure Congress is gonna necessarily dump any more money into, uh, you know, we'll, we'll dump money into the, into the criminal justice system, but you know, we're not gonna, uh, you know, we're always gonna find money to lock someone up, damn it. Uh, but we're, you know, we're not gonna, uh, we're, we're not gonna find that money to, uh, you know, represent someone in a landlord tenant dispute or a child custody dispute or what have you. I can call on people too. Uh, yes. I, I mean, I joke about it. We joke about this all, all the time, and, and uh, you know, th th there is a, a gallows humor. I mean, part of it all, you know, there is a, there, there, part of it. I think is just being naive and, and thinking, you know, thinking, you know, the chances of winning this is, you know, one percent, but we might win. 
Um, but there is, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm a president of the board of directors of the program for torture victims, um, which is the oldest torture treatment program here in the United States. Um, uh, PTV uh, is, has been around for 30 years and, and has a staff of doctors and therapists um, uh, uh, providing psychologists, providing uh, medical and, and case management and, 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 and psychological services to torture survivors. And, and the people, you know, PTV, the staff at PTV, um, you know, uh, uh, I mean, this is, again, secondary trauma and, 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 you know, just being around horrible things. But it really is, I, I, I you know, I derive a tremendous sense of satisfaction, um, uh, uh, you know, when we win, you know, as Rima and I, you know, as we did, as, you know, as we did this morning, is when we, when we win a case in front of a, uh, an immigration judge. Um, and so, you know, dealing with, you know, providing some limited services to people who, you know, who, who experience things that hopefully, you know, most of us in this room have not imagined. Um, I bet there are some people who've imagined it. There, there might, you know, there may even be people who've experienced horror, you know, incredibly horrible things. But we're, you know, we're talking about experiences that at least an average middle class American does not normally experience. There certainly are people here in the United States. But, you know, those individuals are, you know, they're in greater need for, you know, for, for services. And, and, I mean, this is a problem with burnout. Um, uh, uh, being overwhelmed by things. It's not, you know, it happens in all sorts of areas of, uh, you know, of, of, of work, um, you know, working in, in, you know, a medical doctor, a nurse, you know, you know, what, you know what have you. Um, but if you, you know, if you turn your back on these things and you go off and do something that's, you know, you know I mean, people are left without, without services. And so, I mean, it really is. I mean, and then compartmentalization and, and uh, uh, I mean, we, you really do need to carve out time just as you do when you're stressing out as a 1L or a 2L or a 3L. You know, I mean, you know, not to, you know, those are real stresses and, and you need to, you know, you need to have time for yourself and, and, uh, and do fun things. And I definitely, you know, do do things with, you know, my uh, four-legged creatures and, and uh, spouse and friends that, uh, you know, that have nothing to do and, you know, I don't think about, you know, the work that, you know, that, that we do on a regular basis. Yeah. Oh. Go ahead, Raymond. Yes. Where are the local detention facilities? <clears throat> are they jails? Um, uh, uh, the Obama administration is, is increasing the use of for-profit prisons. Um, so Geo Group and Correctional Corporation of America uh, are the two big for-profit prisons that are operating internationally. They're, they're running prisons in Australia, in the UK, South Africa, United States. Um, so here in Los Angeles, the main for-profit prison is up in Adelanto towards Bar Barstow. Um, and then uh, you have 500 plus people there, but uh, the main local coaster in facilities are all down in Orange County right now. Uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement rents uh, two Orange County jails, Theo Lacey and Music, and, um, uh, and then our clients in the clinic, we, we represent uh, a large number of transgender and gay men uh, who are kept in segregated facilities for their own safety at the Santa Ana City Jail. And so Orange County Sheriff and Santa Ana Police Department, they love this because uh, they are making big bucks <laughs> off of renting uh, prison cells to, you know, to, to the federal government. And so this really is a, a, a profit, um, you, know, you know, revenue uh, uh, you know, generator for, for, for local governments. Uh, ICE used to run some of its own detention facilities, but they're getting out of the business because they can do it, they can detain people more cheaply uh, by putting them in for-profit prisons. And, you know, how do you think a for-profit prison makes money? Uh, by you know by, by cutting corners, um, we had a bunch of uh, HIV clients a couple of years ago who were moved from a local facility to a for-profit prison in Pearsall, Texas, um, and uh, you know for the first three weeks, uh, all of our clients were without their HIV, uh, uh, their their antiviral uh, medication, and uh, uh, it just took a while for the you know the healthcare provider to to get up to speed, and they wanted to reevaluate everyone. Um, but, you know, they also save thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars uh, by detaining individuals and not giving them their antivirals. Uh, I'll ask a question. Yes. Uh, so, uh, do you know what's the relationship between the immigration lawyers and the legislature in terms of like, carrying out a comprehensive uh, immigration reform? Uh, like, do they work together or are they more like in the 
Yeah, no, I, I mean the relationship between the immigration bar and and uh, and 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 and, and con, you know legislature. Uh, the, the, there's a National Immigration Bar Association, uh, the, the American Immigration Lawyers Association. Uh, there are lots of smaller uh, organizations. The National Lawyers Guild has a very active uh, 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 immigration, you know, subsection, if you will, called the National Immigration uh, 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 Project that's been very active in lobbying around uh, domestic violence and, and crime uh, for, for DV, Violence Against Women Act um, uh, protections and, and uh, crime victim visas and trafficking visas. Uh, there's, a, there's a very, uh, you know, significant constructive uh, relationship, um, uh, um, uh, you know, between the between the bar uh, here in Los Angeles, the LA County Bar um, is very active in just local liaison activities with uh, uh, with uh, you know with ICE and USCIS and Customs and Border Protection, the the, the you know the, the, the alphabet soup of, of all of the uh, Department of Homeland Security uh, uh, immigration agencies. So there's a you know there's a very you know robust. Uh, you know, and, and, and relationship. Not always, you know, not always, uh, people don't always see eye to eye. Yeah, you're talking about, you know, just thinking about, you know, other career options. I had a, a friend who I actually started out practicing with at the, at the Haitian Refugee Center, uh, who for years was, you know, Senator Ted Kennedy's chief aide on, on immigration. Um, she's actually now a senior aide to Janet Napolitano, uh, Secretary of Homeland Security. Um, but government and legislative positions um, um, are, are, are things, you know, we lose track of on the West Coast, um, uh, but it is something, you know, that, 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 that at least law students on the East Coast are often more in tune with, but it's certainly something, you know, Diane Feinstein um, is, uh, I think, is, is, you know, is probably on the Senate Judiciary Sub Immigration Subcommittee. Uh, so that, you know, it's something you should think about um, uh, if, you're, if you're interested in policy work. You can also think about going to work for Immigration and Customs Enforcement. I've got uh, three or four, uh, you know, USC, of my former USC students who are ICE prosecutors. Um, not something I would do, um, but I would much rather have a smart and fair person prosecuting the case um, uh, than, uh, you know, some racist, crazy person. Uh, you know, raising the case, and we've got both. You know, we've got both types, unfortunately. But um, you can, you know, you can, you can, you know, there, there are fair prosecutors who have to work within, the, you know, work within their their particular rules. So, were you going to say something more? Yeah. Maybe final question. Sure. Do um, you think if you were to develop your own practice, or did you ever want to do your own practice? First and second, if you, if you would have done that, what would you have focused on? I mean, I, you know, again, this is the, the sort of, you know, what I would not do. I just can't ask people for money. Um, uh, you know, I, I, am not a, I am not a business person. Uh, and, and, uh, and if you're going to be a, a lot of immigration laws practice as a sole practitioner in a small firm, and that is you, you've, you've got to have some business skills. Some of you have that. Some of you don't. I just couldn't deal with it. Um, I've always been, you know, fortunate to work in nonprofit offices. Which is a curse, you know, because you're, you know, you're running around trying to raise money all the time, um, but have always been providing free legal services, um, and uh, you know, and again, you know, it's 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 something you know that gives you some flexibility. If you're a public defender, you're providing free legal services, but you're really stuck with you know who your clients are who come through the door. And so some of these organizations that I've worked for, and you know, the, 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 the Haitian Refugee Center is a great example, is, you know, we've been very, they, they were very strategic. Uh, and, and, you know, you can't serve everybody. Um, we're providing free legal services. Let's try to pick some clients uh, where we can affect some, some, some legal changes by, by, you know, literally working on some cases that might be uh, test cases and, uh, um, or, or picking people who are more vulnerable than, than other people. I have some, uh, you know, who, who are more desperate than other people. Um, I have some friends, uh, I have a lot of friends who are, you know, in the for-profit world, small firm world. Um, one, a former colleague, uh, runs a group here in Los Angeles uh, uh, that, that you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a nonprofit, but she charges. Uh, and she uses a sliding scale. And, uh, and so she uses the, the middle class clients who might be able to afford three or four thousand dollars for an immigration uh, petition or a case to subsidize the people who, who've got no money. And, and that's something that the legal aids of the world, I don't think they're able to do that under the, you know, the terms of their, their, uh, uh, you know, their, their, their governance. But people who are starting, you know, small nonprofits or, or people in, in certain types of nonprofits uh, are, are able to do that. And that's a very creative way 
to um, uh, and, and a lot of you know a lot of people obviously do pro bono work and you know all of these firms that are doing pro bono work you know they're paying clients or subsidizing you know their their pro bono work and so this is you know doing what the O'Melveny uh, admirers of the world do on a, on, a, on a smaller scale um, but it is you know it is a you know it is a way where you can you know pick some cases where you might you know be more interested and in, in find it more rewarding to represent certain people who can't afford a lawyer as opposed to the you know. The, the you know the deadbeat dad who uh, uh, isn't paying you know child support and is uh, you know we don't give passports to people who in this country who are behind on child support payments um, and, and and so you know fighting over trying to get a passport you know even though you're fifty thousand dollars behind on you know child care support you know uh, it's not my not not my battle um, but you know he might might be a, you know might be able to pay uh, and you know maybe you take his money to fund some other people. All right, well, so thank, thank you. you. And um, please join me in thanking Professor. <laughs>